Della Bond. I'm a key account manager with Fortis BC, and uh, my sector is uh, federal and provincial gov government, so public sector, office buildings, grocery, and uh, retail malls. So I'm going to introduce Albert today. Um, Albert brings innovation and creativity to a project. He also conveys his ideas with passion and clarity. Albert champions the use of sustainable solutions in all of his projects and has extensive in expertise in sus sustainable master planning, SMP, high performance and net zero buildings, including district renewable energy analysis, passive building design, modeling building energy usage, thermal comfort and indoor air quality conditions. He has a wide range of experience in Canada, US and Asia, including the SMP for several university campuses and consulting services for mixed use developments in North America and Asia. Without further ado, Albert. Thank you. So we're gonna make this as short as possible so you guys can get out. It's beautiful up there. And I took the sky train, so it's beautiful up there. Um, Today I'm going to talk about my 20 year experience in sustainable design. Um, I'm actually 44, I'm pretty old now. And uh, I've been in the industry for 20 years. <laughs> Sorry. I just want to have that now. I feel that way. But uh, it's been, it seems like a long career. Um, and I'm going to sum it up for you guys today. Um, and that's it, one slide, but I can show you about sustainable design. <laughs> this actually affects, uh, let, me, let me step back. Um, I asked my wife, yeah, what do facilities managers do? Because she used to work for Gateway Property Management, and I think they deal with them, and they, she said, well, you know what, they do a lot. You know, they, 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 if there's complaints in the building, they, they, they look at uh, mechanical systems, electrical systems, uh, things like that, and cleaning and everything. I'm like, well, this is perfect, because I'm a mechanical engineer and I design everything that screws up in their, their lives. So uh, this is probably good context for you guys. So this is what I believe in, and what I learned over 20 years in, in, in summary, that sustainable buildings should not be high tech. Sustainable buildings should rely on old technology in a sim si as simple as possible. I think the most successful projects that I've been part of, and I'm gonna show you at least half a dozen projects, they were very, very simple. And the projects that I failed and had issues with, commissioning, uh, future maintenance, and for what you guys do, are these projects. Very complex buildings and systems. So hopefully, I contribute to your happiness today and uh, make things a lot simpler for your career and jobs. <laughs> so this is it. Um, I look at things like, uh, and I relate to these kind of things, that's radiant heating. The caveman actually invented radiant heating. This is a technology that I ran into a few days ago. They actually, this billboard actually condenses water and provides drinking water. Right. Some of these technologies are old technologies. This is, of course, you know, the process is old. Um, wind turbines were not used for electricity in the olden days. They were used to run pumps, right? Um, so we were actually not using them in the right context, and I'll get to that later. That's how you design buildings in Saudi Arabia, in the Middle East. Not glass towers with 10, 20, 200 ton chillers to cool them off. They were done this way, and we don't listen. We don't, we don't pay attention to what, how things are being done. And I'm sure you're noticing that uh, buildings in Vancouver look like buildings in Toronto now, in condominiums. It's wrong. It's the wrong way. It's not climate adaptive design. Um, churches have been around for so long. They work. They ne never see any maintenance issues or anything. I know they're older. Um, that is the most sustainable building in where I'm from, in the Philippines. It's the Nipah Hut. Slope roof. You know, the rain, the monsoons, everything. Why are we building flat roofs in, in, in Manila? And they leak. And you wonder why they leak. Well, look at what their ancestors did. They sloped the roof. Um, they have shading, natural ventilation. It's raised up so the cool air goes through the bottom. See, we have to look at these kind of things. And once again, I'm proud. Uh, I, my sister emailed me this the other day. 
these Filipinos in the slums of the Philippines invented this light. It's a Coca-Cola bottle with a detergent or, or, or some bleach in it. And they have daylighting with no electricity in their houses. It was invented from the slums. Okay? I'm implementing this technology right now on a few of the projects I'm working on. This is the smartest DDC control you can have. They're ants. Basically, when it gets too hot in their ant mounds, the worker ants make bigger holes at the bottom so that they have more natural ventilation through their ant mound. That's DDC control. So I'll just start from the beginning. I started in Winnipeg, very, very cold climate, and I learned the hard way uh, of how to design in cold climates. Um, when I started uh, looking at sustainable systems, I looked at mechanical systems, and this is your greatest nightmare, people, right? Maintain, maintaining this type of equipment. It's, it's my, my, my sort of uh, way of designing net zero buildings is to eliminate these systems as much as possible. Eliminate mechanical systems as much as possible. So I looked at this as not necessarily the best approach in sustainability. Looking at the efficiency of chillers, looking at the efficiency of mechanical systems, looking at efficiencies of electrical systems, Right? That's not, it's a limiting factor. It's limiting to what we can do. By the way, um, the people who design these systems are the best at Googling the newest technology. Right? They find the latest technology in chillers and so on and so on. Air conditioning systems, there's VRF, there's geothermal, all these kind of things are coming up. You can't keep up with them. Right? And I'm pretty lazy, so I, I try to not know all this stuff. And then LEED came around. I'm sure you're familiar with LEED. LEED, you know, I think the purpose of LEED was to take the bottom feeders and raise them up. But the people in the middle and the people that are extremely sustainable, LEED just gets in the way. And I'm just being very, very blunt with you. It just gets in the way. Just imagine, you know, I've seen a lot of design charts with uh, owners and there's a LEED meeting and you're looking at points and the owner is like, hell all this stuff. Right? We're bombarding them with what they don't need. Right? There's too much information, and uh, I think uh, it's good for one, for one, for a few reasons, and it's not good for certain reasons. So, um, in 2006, this is me. Uh, let's see here, striving for nothing. Uh, this is the first time I presented on Net Zero Buildings in 2006 in Greenville in Denver. Next door was David Suzuki. <laughs> you can Google it. He was at the same time I was presenting. Uh, David Suzuki was presenting, and I had 200 people standing room in 2006. Because it's the first time everyone's, in my, in my records, everyone, anyone has presented on Net Zero Energy Buildings. So uh, if you Google Net Zero, you'll get thousands of hits now. I remember the time where I came back from Denver and I said, Edward Smith was the CEO of, um, of uh, uh, Cobalt Engineering at the time. I said, hey Ed! We, could, we need to trademark net zero in 2006. You know, we could be, you know, we could be famous for all this stuff. I said, nah, too many lawyers, it'll take too long, all this stuff. So now net zero is a buzzword. Right. Anyways, that is the actual presentation in 2006. And I was at Cobalt at the time. Um, and that's how we designed net zero buildings. Recognize designs options early. And by the way, uh, when I presented this at Denver, I, the marketing department, I asked them to use the Z for these rules of thumbs, and it was very difficult for them. <laughs> <laughs> Not good Scrabble players. <laughs> and then the E, and then I said, let's try the O, because the R is the laziest thing we can do, so we ended up with the R. Uh, recognize designs, designs options early. I've actually never seen a facilities manager at the beginning of the design charade on any of my projects. You guys should be up front in these projects because you have a lot of input to provide. Really, the engineer designs it and he's gone after it's built. That's like probably 10% of the lifetime of this building. And then you guys inherit it and you're there forever. So you should have some say in how these buildings are designed. Um, reduce your energy consumption, number one rule. Not Google PV panels, not Google chillers and boilers, right? Not Google net zero, what did everyone do? 
No, reduce your energy consumption is the most important thing on net zero energy buildings. Use daylighting, natural ventilation, all this stuff. We'll get into that. Remember the laws of physics. Hot air rises. And as you can tell, I'm sure you've seen all the air, condi air conditioning systems blow the air from the top down. They don't follow the laws of physics. None of these systems do. Hot air rises, and you'll, I'll show you all the projects that I'm in part of. We supply air at the bottom, and we let the hot air rise. It's quite simple. Because if you don't follow the laws of physics, you're wasting energy. Okay? Um, and then, um, any energy you use, you recycle and recycle. So, who knows the first law of thermodynamics? Anybody? You do? Pretty good, yeah. <laughs> Energy is neither creator or destroyer. Pretty good. You just missed one. Um, so, energy in, uh, with, hmm, that's strange. Let's, let's skip here quickly. Energy from the grocery store at the, at the Olympic Village, I think this is Whole Foods. We take refrigeration energy, waste heat, it turns in, there, the coldness to produce cold produces a byproduct of heat, right, in, in these uh, chill, uh, freezers and refrigerators. That is a lower grade heat. You can't destroy that, lower grade energy. We take that energy and we use that to heat our building, okay, for the Olympic Village, Net Zero Building. We'll get to that later. So you recycle and recycle. Energy can't be destroyed. It just changes form. So what's the second law of thermodynamics? Irreversible. Uh, yeah, entropy. So uh, all energy goes from a high state to a low state and eventually uh, dissipates into the environment. That's entropy. So until we get to that entropy state or that, that high state, we can reuse and reuse. That's true perpetual motion, if you think about it. Just that we can't figure out how to use that energy all the way through. So, having said that, can I tell you guys right now, there is no energy problem on the Earth. Does everyone believe me now, after understanding the laws of thermodynamics and everything? The only problem we have as humans is we're addicted to high-grade energy. We're addicted to electricity and we're addicted to natural gas. So don't say that we have an energy problem. We have an electricity problem, and we have a fossil fuels problem. That's it. Okay? Until the sun disappears, we will not have an energy problem on the Earth. No energy problem. So, um, the, the trick to us, and I'm going to show you a lot of examples, we need to rely on low-grade energy sources, natural energy sources, not high-grade electricity. Okay, so the last thing we do is uh, we offset any energy that we use, we offset that energy with renewable energy. That's how we get the net zero part of the equation. Okay, so 2006 to 2012 came, uh, came around and I started, you know, uh, with cobalt engineering saying that all our buildings we should look at net zero. And in 2000, the reason why I put 2012 here is I left cobalt or now integral group uh, at 2012. To enjoy, I see my daughter there, so I said, you know, I'm going to sort of semi-retire and enjoy her growing up. Um, I was all over the place at Cobalt. I was business development. I was in New York, Manila, Thailand, everywhere. And that, I'll show you the map that I went everywhere. So, anyways, um, 2000. To, let's start with. Uh, let's finish with this project. This is the Olympic Village, and I don't want to get into the, all the horror stories and the bad press. It's n these 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 suites are not expensive because of sustainability. Right. I'm going to give you my truth, not the press's truth. The reason why these, these condos are expensive is because someone had to pay for the Olympics. Right. And there's a bad financial situation. There's so many other reasons. It's not the sustainability part. The net zero building only had a 2 to 5% increase in cost to go to net zero as a premium compared to all these condominiums in, in, on the site. So it's not a big deal. Okay, so we have our net zero, it's 64 units of social housing, city of Vancouver, um, triple pane windows, we have R40 walls, we have a green roof, everywhere, everywhere is a green roof on all the buildings. We took the corridor on the south side. We took it out of the middle and put it on the outside so we don't have to heat and cool and ventilate the corridor and we don't have to light it up. 
So we saved energy just like that. Also, this provided social sustainability because the seniors who's going to be living here, or the social uh, housing people, they typically don't interact in corridors. But now they're out here and we'll get, there's planters and everyone interact. There's seating areas and stuff like that. So there's social sustainability. Um, also on the south facade, it provides shading for the windows. So it's a natural shade uh, for them. Uh, it's cross-ventilated, so that's the ventilation system, that's it. There's no H HRV or mechanical system to maintain or to operate. Um, let's see what else. Oh, it's radiantly heated. We get all our heat from the grocery store, Whole Foods. I think it's Whole Foods, or it can be Urban Fair. But anyways, we, we, t we, we take all their waste heat. As you can see, they don't have a cooling tower. We save them money. So, because we take all the heat into our system. Uh, it's radiantly heated and we produce more hot water or heat and that's for the showers. And then we sell the heat to all the other market buildings. That's how we get the net zero part. We, we need electricity for the lighting and the stove and everything like that. But then to offset that energy with renewable energy, we sell hot water to all the neighbors. And that's how we get our net zero. Okay, so I looked at net zero buildings around the world. Uh, we looked at a project in New York, Mexico, Sri Lanka, uh, Manila, Singapore, everywhere, Korea. Um, there's an interesting project here which we're going to talk about. Uh, there's a net zero resort in uh, Easter Island on a dormant volcano. That we're going to look at here. here it is. So they wanted to put um, a resort on a dormant volcano. And they wanted to actually make it net zero. And I'm like, well, there's no electricity, there's no water, there's nothing there, so it better be net zero, right? <laughs> what are you going to do? Put a hydro line or an electricity line all the way from here, somewhere in the ocean? It's like, that's incredible. So it had to go net zero. And uh, there, there's a few schemes that we looked at. We looked at tapping into uh, the lava below. Even though it's dormant, they're still running uh, steam underneath. We were going to tap into the steam and create electricity through generators through the steam and then provide heating that way and provide cooling through absorption chillers. So the steam was the main uh, driver for this and we created heating, cooling and electricity with the steam. Uh, let's see, um, oh sorry, 2008 to 2012 we looked at net zero campuses now, net zero uh, community planning, net zero city planning, uh, and so on and so on. So then after Greenbuild, I, I spoke at the SCUP conference. You guys know what SCUP conference is? Well, they're the Society of Campus University Planners. So this is where uh, uh, the planners of UBC, Harvard, all these people, they gather, and so on and so on. So they thought, oh, this is great, net zero campuses. And I, once again, I had a full house there in, in Portland. And I began, uh, I wrote, I sort of, sort of uh, gave them a presentation on how, to, how campus has become net zero. And then after that, conveniently, we had the carbon tax. And all university campuses have to be carbon neutral or else they get a carbon penalty. And we started getting clients like uh, UVic. Where's UVic? Where's UVic? UVic. Uh, Quatlin, so we got a lot of clients looking at trying to get their campuses to be net zero. So it's, it, it was pretty fortunate for us in the business sense. This is um, Edmonton Airport lands, so we won the competition with uh, uh, Perkins and Will, and that was the goal there was to be carbon neutral. 30,000 residences. Uh, the old downtown airport was master plan. Um, and we, we, had, we, are, we won the competition because we, we proposed carbon neutral there for the whole university, I mean the, the whole uh, community. So before I left Cobalt, we got, uh, we got hired to look at um, um, a 450 year old campus in the Philippines. It's a, the oldest campus in, in that part of the world and basically what they told us is we always have these North American consultants and they tell us that we should put air conditioning in our buildings, we should close our windows and then add more lighting and so on and so on. We want somebody, because I interviewed, I said we should re-engineer re, re everything, reverse engineer everything. 
These buildings have three foot walls. They're naturally ventilated. They're daylit and so on and so on. So I said, we're going to look at a, a, a master plan for you guys to actually bring this back to passive ways of, build, of the way these uh, buildings operated over the past. So that's a project there. This is College of the Desert in Palm Springs. It, it's a 100 acre new campus. 80 acres is solar PV. And by the way, you don't see here, that's all the wind farms that they have in, if you've been to Palm Springs. They have, oh, it's impressive. I've never seen that site before. All these wind turbines, you know, on, by the highway. Um, so that, that camp is going to be uh, net zero. That's the Olympic Village. We were part of the master plan there. This is uh, Vancouver Island University. We tapped into the underground water mines. That, the, water, un, the water underneath those abandoned mines is the energy source now for Vancouver Island University. No one ever thought of using it. It's just right under their noses. So we tapped into that and that's the source of the district system, district heating and cooling system in, on that site. UVic, um, Kwatlin there, this is Kwatlin. Oh, this is a resort in, uh, in Vail, Colorado. It's a billion dollar resort that we master plan. And some of the neat ideas that we came up with is they, they wanted snow, snow melting uh, on the site for, for ski, a high-end ski resort. And one of the people at Cobalt, young, a young lady uh, out of university, said, well, why don't we use glass to melt the snow from the sun? And I proposed, because, oh, that, man, that's a great idea. But, it, you know, there's some logistics behind it, like, you know, they'll freeze up, and what type of mechanism do we have, and all that stuff. So it's, it was quite difficult, but I thought it was a great idea. It's, it's in line with using natural means, like the sun, to melt the snow, and so on and so on. Um, that one wasn't carbon neutral though, it was just a master plan. So then 2009, 2012 came around and we looked at living buildings. And this is, this is probably one of the best projects that I've been part of. This is the SFU daycare. Have you guys seen this project? Uh, it's been in the news quite a bit uh, in, in the sustainability world. Um, just a few highlights. No ductwork. This is, I'm going to show you a lot of projects here where there's no ductwork, no VAB boxes, nothing to maintain. This is a, a thermal active slab. It's radiantly heated and it's perfect for the kids because they're always on the floor, right? So it makes sense. Solar thermal panels produce hot water. We store that and that's for washing your hands and it actually used for uh, the radiant slab. Excess Hot water we sell back to SFU for their district heating system. That offsets our electricity and that's our net zero building. Ventilation is done by please open your window. Okay, so that's it. That's, that's how ventilation is done on, on the building. Uh, there is an HRV for winter. So passive design and look at the simplicity of the architecture. I, I can tell you right now, this is my favorite project. Um, not only because we, this is a living building, if you guys heard of living building, this is net zero everything and then there's pedals and everything. So uh, this is so much different than LEED, um, but there's a kicker to this project and I'm just going to skip over right here. $689 a square foot versus $895, typical daycare in the lower mainland. Net zero, sustainable, simple to operate, simple to maintain, at 20% less cost, overall cost, than, than the average lower mainland daycare. That is the most important part of me. And I'll go back there. So that is probably my favorite project because, you know, anybody can design. Every engineer has the technical know-how. Uh, the only difference between a great engineer, a uh, good engineer, and a great engineer is passion and uh, determination to, to get things done. We're all technically equal. Anybody can design this, but the 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 prizes that you win, or in my opinion, is can we make these buildings at cost or below? Can we design them so that they're actually lower than than regular building cost? And this one did. Okay, lessons learned, just quickly through. So, 
Throughout my career, I was looking at sustainability and trying to change the market. That was my job at Cobalt, was to look at different ways of being perceived as engineers and looking at new ways of designing buildings. And what I found out was that as engineers, we're wired to improve on certain things. We got existing, we got existing this thing, and then we improve on the handle, where this thing seals up better, and then that's, that's creativity for an engineer. Um, I looked at things like um, how Google does it and Apple does it, and I analyzed that while I was at Cobalt. And then I, and then I started to figure out what my daughter does. Basically, you give her rules, and she doesn't care. And then she does something else, and I'm going, wow, that was pretty good. Because what happens is, creativity occurs when you have no rules. Okay, creativity occurs, the, the, the sign of creativity is creating something out of nothing. That's my way of looking at creativity. If I was, if I was just to improve on this, and what that's typical engineering, that's not creativity. That's not creativity at all. So when I woke up that one morning and they asked me to present at Greenbuild, I said, we're gonna go net zero. We're gonna go net zero. And then I produced my presentation. And that's sort of my example, my world of how I thought about creativity. And it was two or three in the morning. I said, let's do net zero buildings. I'm gonna do that. Okay, integrated design. So everyone's familiar with integrated design, which you guys aren't part of. <laughs> which I wish you guys were. You, maybe I'll, uh, we, 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 if you guys are project managers, architects, engineers, construction, commissioning agent, building users, that's close. <laughs> building owners, that's getting really close. There it is, you guys aren't here. So you guys are part of this, but how come I've never seen anybody in my meetings? So nobody actually practices integrated design. <laughs> <laughs> There's an exception. <laughs> So we do. That's, that, that's the truth. We, we do because the idea of people designing something and then handing the keys over to the people operating and saying basically good luck with this. Yeah. And walking out and if you're lucky we'll give you a technical manual or two is, is absolutely a name. Uh, so I think I think what's happening is in our shop, our building operators are becoming our in-house electrical and mechanical experts. And the people doing the design are backing off on that and then just focusing on architectural and interior design. Yeah. I think the world's things are shifting. That's good. I think that's good. Okay, so my opinion on integrated design. Over 20 years, I don't know, the last 5, 10 years was important in terms of an integrated design. It has nothing to do with collaboration or teamwork, in my opinion. We have a fixed cost. How do we transfer costs from mechanical to architectural to make the building more passively performing and make it simpler? That's integrated design. Basically, integrated design is how can we manage the client's budget. In my opinion, that's the way I look at it. I know that we're, there's so many other definitions of it, but I, I, the, the white elephant in the room is you could be the greatest architectural firm, greatest engineering firm in the world. You could put an all-star team together and if the client has a $10 million budget and you don't meet it, you're a terrible team. You're a terrible team. So the white elephant in the room is always about cost. And I didn't learn that for how many years in my career until I got to the end that it's all about cost. Operational cost and capital cost. So I'm, I'm going to show you a few examples and where I am now in my career and I'll show you how I look and focusing cost and sustainability. I'm not ignoring it, but uh, addressing the white elephant in the room first. Biomimicry, that's something I learned, and of course we learned from the ants on how to design that um, natural ventilation. Um, this is an example of biomimicry. You guys know biomimicry? Mm -hmm. Understand biomimicry? So the study of plants and animals on the site, mimic your building. Never implemented in my opinion. <laughs> you know, it's just not something that everyone uses. Um, engineering wise, we put weather stations on the site and we study the, the, the local microclimate. This is the one in uh, Langara, Langara College that we installed on the roof. Um, Filipina ladies in the Philippines, uh, they, they use umbrellas not only when it's raining but during the sunny days to keep the sun off when they're walking in, on the streets. And some can do too. Try not to, it's not 
<laughs> not cool. But uh, and then they you know try to walk slowly. You know why people walk slowly in the Philippines? Because if you walk fast, you'll sweat. It's too hot. So you, everyone walks slow, just so they're not, not sweating. Anyways, um, so what we did there in biomimicry terms is uh, we were the sustainability consultant for this children's museum, and uh, basically I inspired the architect to put an umbrella over the because the the questions were okay. Solar control, how are we going to limit air conditioning and stuff, stuff like that? So, it's, you know, do we look at shading? Do we look at glass? Do we look at insulation type of concrete? And go, why don't we just put an umbrella on the whole, on the whole building and then that's it? That's solar control. And yes, this, this building is built and it's fully shaded by, uh, by an overhead structure on it. And we didn't have to worry about the windows and stuff like that on the project. So, that was my example of biomimicry. And I'm passionate about passive design. That was my my main interest in engineering. Um, my the the former uh, my former partners at Cobalt. When I said, you know, we need to eliminate mechanical systems. That's the game changer for our industry. Okay, we need to represent that Cobalt will reduce or eliminate the mechanical systems in the building. We need to start with passive design. That's when we started getting to the table very early in the game. You know, that's when Perkins and Will, all these large architectural firms would call us. You know, usually we're always, you know, at the end we get a proposal later. We're at the beginning of the, of the stage because we understood passive design. And this is the passive design guideline for the city of Vancouver. And well, I'm one of the authors of it. You can download it for free on it. So um, how we won this project was there was 19 architects in one engineering firm and we won it. So, and I, I made fun of all the architects, I called them all up and said, hey, we won this thing. Do you guys want to work for us? <laughs> um, anyways, uh, passive design is architectural, but it has a lot of science behind it. There's a lot of science behind it. <clears throat> this is good for you guys, honestly. <laughs> Managing expectations. Okay? When you have a sustainable building or a passive building, sometimes it's not 20 degrees. Sometimes it's 24. Okay? So when we design the building, if the user group or the ownership group understands the intention of the design, so we can manage expectations, when it's 26 degrees in that building, you shouldn't get any complaints. That's managing expectation. And I know this is kind of you know fluffy and everything. I this is very very effective because everybody has this thing that the building should be 20 degrees 24 seven or else I'm getting out of here, right? That's the expectation that we we bring to North America. This little boy is expecting a blue sweater for Christmas and he gets a red sweater, right? Even though it's Lululemon maybe it's a better sweater than he was asking for. Still he's upset. Right? So you can create a better building, but if it's not managing their expectation or, or it's not what they're expecting, you will get complaints. Complaints is more psychological than physical. And we're going to get into thermal comfort later. People shouldn't be complaining about too hot or too cold in the building. And I've read that about facilities managers, by the way. Well, you guys have to handle it's too hot or too cold in the building. That's your number one complaint, right? Do I agree? Too hot or too cold? I'm going to help you guys. Okay, thermal mass is very, very important. This is what I learned over the years. Thermal mass can, can actually stabilize an environment in this space. So if you have issues with a building that's fluctuating in temperature, take the carpet out, expose the ceiling. If there's concrete under there, it'll stabilize it. Thermal mass can reduce air conditioning uh, capacities and, and heating capacities in our buildings. It's, it absorbs heat and absorbs cooling or releases cooling into the space if you know how to use it properly. Okay? And this is proven not in the passive design guideline, but anyways, if you have enough thermal mass in your building and you do night cooling, I can tell you right now, I know, I know I'm on camera, you can design a building with no air conditioning in the lower mainland. And I, almost every building in the lower mainland has air conditioning. Because we don't know how to design buildings. Right? We're using the old, let's put glass towers in Saudi Arabia. 
right? Or in Manila, the glass tower there. This is how we did, should be designing buildings. This is Langara Library. That is SFU daycare. All exposed concrete. This is Kwatlin Library. Exposed concrete, right? Open structures. And architects love exposing concrete. So why don't we have a, why don't we do, like, this is terrible drywall. Ceiling tile, right? You have to maintain your stuff. It gets dusty up there, right? Polished concrete is so much better than carpet. You guys have a budget for clean, for replacing concrete, uh, carpet. And it gets dirty. It's unhealthy carpet, right? Carpet You can always polish concrete, don't worry. <laughs> And then here's here's one thing that we were we were told by the client: concrete cracks, concrete cracks, right? It's true. There's no way of preventing no cracks in the concrete. So guess what we did at Kotlin? We added cracks, so it looks like it's done on purpose. If you go to Kotlin Library, there are actually cracks on purpose, so that there's when there's a crack, oh yeah, it was there. It was supposed to be there. That's an architectural feature of the building. So that's how we handle cracks. Okay, hot air rises. So I learned this over the years, and you know what? It hit me over the head. Of, why the hell do we design buildings with air conditioning for blowing air? You know what? That, that air up there will never get down here. It's not. In a movie theater, who goes to movie theaters? Everyone gets cold feet because the, the diffuser is 30 feet up in the air. You think that hot air is getting down there? It's not. It's not going to get down there. Anyways, um, this is uh, Regent College Library. You'll love this because there's no maintenance required in this building, and it's it's simple to maintain. And by the way, oh, I'll, I'll get to those. Um, air, air gets introduced through intake scoops, and then they diffuse at low level through diffusers in, un, from the underground. And hot air will rise because the cool air finds heat sources like people and lights and computers. It produces hot air, and hot air rises. There's a chimney. It creates stack effect. The, the top of the chimney has a wind uh, airfoil shaped top. As air blows across the top, it creates lift and pull. That's the air handler. No maintenance. That's it. This building has been in operation for five years. We have a CO2 sensor in the building. It never has a CO2 alarm. I've never gotten a call that we have problems with with uh, improper ventilation conditions inside the space. This building did not need balancing. Okay, I got this call from the balancer when it got built, and he said, how do we balance this thing? There's no airflow, there's no fan, there's nothing to balance in this building. This is how the building works. If there's one person in the space, every person here produces 50 CFM of hot air. We're full of hot air, right? We make hot air. It creates a plume, and it's scientifically proven, and it goes up. So you create this plume. So if there's one person in this room, it will pull the air from the outside, and then exhaust. When you're blowing air, it goes straight up, and doesn't go everywhere, like this does. It, the pollutants actually <coughs> get it to go everywhere, and it goes straight up. If there's 400 people in the, in the library, that's 50 CFM each, then it pulls more air. It's self-adjusting. It's self-balancing. That's why we never get CO2 alarms in the building. That's it. That's the ventilation system. The heating is done by uh, radiant heating. Cooling is done by underground water. And the heating and cooling and ventilation energy is by just one kilowatt of energy. 10 light bulbs to heat, cool, and ventilate that library. One pump. That's simple as it gets. So your contract is to maintain this pump. It's that simple. Five years in operation. Um, we did have to supplement the solar thermal, or it was replaced by uh, some boilers, um, because we couldn't get the solar thermal panels on the existing Regent College roof. It didn't pay back because we had to structurally enhance the roof that added to the cost of the solar thermal panels. 
Oh, by the way, this building, if we went conventional with uh, air handlers and ductwork and VAB boxes everywhere, it would have cost so much more. We saved the client the money. And it's easy to operate and easy to maintain. Okay, so here's your comfort issue. And you guys always have this issue. I'm going to tell you right now, it's not the mechanical's fault why it's too hot or too cold in the building. You will never solve some of the issues of being too hot or too cold in the building by the mechanical system. You will actually make it worse. Okay? The reason why southwest offices are too hot is because there's no shading on the window. That's it. So when you look into, when I get called and I said, well, it's not my fault, it's the architect's fault. They didn't put shading on the window. Even in Vancouver, if you, you know, all these full height glass, the main problem of, of, the main problem of being too hot in a space is what we call radiant non-symmetry. That means that there is a stove or some fire over here, 40 degrees Celsius glass, and then on the other side, the air conditioning is giving her this 20, 25 degree side. The radiant non-symmetry, you cannot stand. It's very difficult to, to be in that office. That's what we call radiant non-symmetry. That's too hot. Not the air temperature. This air temperature is regulated by your thermostat on the wall. But the thermostat on the wall does not tell you how hot or cold you are. It's the radiant, it's the surface temperatures of the room. So when you come in there to see in a complaint, you should have a gun that's measuring surface temperature. Because air temperature does not tell you how hot or cold it is in the space. And by the way, it's not my fault because I designed the system to produce 20 degree air temperature in the space. So the mechanical systems have been designed properly. The architectural systems have not. That's why we work with a lot of architects to produce comfort. The first line of comfort is always the architecture, not the engineering system. The engineering system, and there's, an old, there's a joke out there, um, engineers were, were put on the earth to fix architectural mistakes. Okay? So basically, for the same example that I use over and over again today, they can build glass towers in Dubai because of engineering of the glass towers, right? That's not the right approach. So anyways, that is your radiant non-symmetry. That's your number one complaint when it's too hot or too cold in the space. And in, it's the reverse in heating. Cold glass causes radiant non-symmetry. Cold feet is mostly air, but actually cold faces is cold glass. It's that radiant effect. And we talked about this already, uh, how to achieve high indoor air quality in the space, supply low, exhaust high. That's set. All systems that we see here today mixes the air. So if I had a cold and I'm the only one talking in the room, you guys are just listening, you're breathing my air, and you'd get sick, right, if you catch my cold. This is not the best way to design systems. It's supply low, exhaust high, one in and then out. Um, this is like their library. It won a lot of uh, awards for sustainability. One of the features of the project is six wind towers. Uh, Regent College, which we did, I designed first, the architect loved the wind tower effect, and they have six on this one. He had a higher budget. Then <laughs> Stephen Teeple out, uh, out of Toronto had a bigger budget on his project. Um, Another feature of the building is curved roof. So when you design a building and it has a flat roof, the wind blows across the top, it creates friction, and then it tumbles. The wind has to tumble through the roof. If you curve the roof, the wind blows across the top and it accelerates, so we get more aerodynamic pull out of the wind towers. This, had, this was uh, valued engineered. And I saw Stephen Teeple, he was going to walk out and quit on the job. And he says, if that roof, and of course everybody knows that curved roof is expensive, right? If that curved roof was eliminated from the project, this whole mechanical system won't work. And we'll have to redesign the whole mechanical system. It was partially right, but I just, I just left it alone. So the curved roof does, a, does have a function on this project. Daylighting. 
Another thing I learned is passive design of daylight. Very, very important, even in Vancouver. All these spaces are daylight. All these spaces are daylight, yeah. Um, so basically, this is a local product out of Richmond. They're called Sun Central. I've, I've, uh, I know the inventor out of UBC. I've been helping them develop this product. This is an underground station in New York. All the sun comes through with the Sun Central system and trees are growing under, underground. Hospitals, daylight, we all know how important daylight is for people to get well. My mother passed away with cancer and she told me, Albert, you're a mechanical engineer, I know what you do. All hospitals should be radiant heat. Don't blow hot air on patients. I need a view to the outside and there should be daylight and I will get better faster. And I said, boy, you, you know a lot about engineering. So uh, I think, well, anyways, um, the classroom studies have shown that uh, t uh, students perform better when it's daylight. That's a daylight. That's daylight. This is an office full of daylight. This is the, I'm, I'm, I'm so happy that they're finally out to market with this system. And, and the, the unique thing about the system is their, their lighting fixtures can go into the building 50 feet. You can fully daylight offices like 100% of the floor plate if it's 100 feet end to end. You go from one end to the other 100 feet. I know there's not much of a payback here, but then uh, the way the Sun Central sells the system is, yeah, you know, higher sales, uh, people get better faster, students, you know, you have to look at the soft cost of daylighting. And we all agree, I, you should always have daylighting. Because you guys, higher, easier to control and maintain. Would you like to maintain that and control that sucker? With DVC, Johnson controls, whatever, they give you a manual this freaking thick, right? And the maintenance manual is that thick? Kwatlin Library and the other projects that I've been part of, uh, they've been 20 degrees almost all the time. It never changes because of the thermal slab and the radiant heating and cooling. It's, it's self-maintaining. Future proofing, if you, if you stick to basic principles, keep it simple, stupid, everything is pretty much future proof. I don't know how you guys keep up with technology and how to operate and maintain them. You guys, it's difficult. I, I, I feel for you guys. Like, to me, to design a building that's future-proof, you shouldn't rely on high-tech solutions because it's not a winning game. Like, I, I, I love TVs, and I buy a TV every boxing day, but it, it's obsolete every year. LED, LCD, it's like plasma, it's like, holy cow. My iPhone is obsolete, and I got an iPhone 5, right? It's like, holy cow, this, you can't catch up to these things. So why do we design buildings that we can't catch up to? High-tech buildings. This is a building in, um, in Burnaby, the incineration plant. We take the domestic cold water, we put it, on, in, uh, put it through a heat exchanger, and you get radiant cooling. We take the waste heat from the plant, take a lot of waste heat, put it through a heat exchanger, get radiant heating. Ventilation is done with please open your window and a wind tower. That's it. Go quickly here. Uh, district energy, I don't think you guys need to hear about that too much. That's the triple bottom line. Let's not all pretend the economic circle is the number one circle in the triple bottom line. Everyone advertises, everyone's gung-ho of the triple bottom line. I'm Mr. CEO and I say what goes. And we should be sustainable, <laughs> right? Here's another project for you guys. Lab buildings, very difficult to maintain and operate. Uh, is similar to hospitals. Typical system for a lab building. VAV boxes, pressure boxes, fume hoods, heat reclaim, makeup air. It's incredible, right? Four foot interstitial spaces. Like, it's packed in, the, in, these, in these labs and hospitals. UBC 50 building we designed. We took out the interstitial space. Everything is radiantly heated, cooled by the slab. Air, all the air comes through the skin for makeup air. Only ductwork is in the corridor for fume hood exhaust. We reclaim 
We dropped the building three feet for every floor because we eliminated all these systems. We saved the UBC half a million dollars in mechanical equipment cost. And this building operates at 50% less than the neighbor lab building designed by our, the competitor at the time. Because they keep track of the utility bills. And they always email it to me until now. This building is operating way beyond what they've expected in terms of energy costs. If you put that in real dollars, how much they're saving, they save nearly $70,000 a year in energy costs in this building. And there is no payback. There was no premium to do this building. Because we took away all these systems that they didn't need. And guess what? The building <coughs> operates 20 degrees all year long. And the thermostats really are almost dumb thermostats. On the side. Because when you, when you turn the thermostat hotter, it takes six hours before the slab can heat up. Right? And once again, managing expectations. We told them that this building will be one temperature all year long, so now we're managing expectations on that. It's a good project. And that's how simple it is. Our only ductwork in this building is in the corridor. That's the fume exhaust. We couldn't do the fume exhaust passively or naturally because we kill some people in the, in the building with the fume exhaust. <laughs> like, you know, why don't we relieve all the, all the contaminants into the corridor and then relieve the corridor, but that's not going to work. Business case, this is a project we did in Los Angeles at CNN Top 10 Sustainable Buildings in the World. It has a, uh, in the west facade that's hard to shave, it has a metal grate with holes in it. So all the holes were engineered so that you could see through it as a view, but the sun doesn't get in. It's just science of light and how it bends and everything. You, you can open it, but it's, uh, it's neat. Uh, Cherokee Studios is the name. You can Google it. Um, this is where the Eagles recorded, down in the basement. We're not that, I'm not that age. 44, 45. Yeah. That's the most important part uh, of great engineer or great architect or a visionary is all about communication and understanding uh, passion. That guy, I read a lot of his bio. Uh, have you guys seen Simon Sinek? You should TED Talks him. Simon Sinek. Great companies occur of the why factor. Apple, because we're cool. You should, why do you buy Apple? Because it's cool, right? Most companies are structured this way. We, how we do it, and this is what we do. That's it. But why we do it makes great companies. That's how Apple is structured. If you look at Starbucks, Tim Hortons is better copyright. Everyone agree? <laughs> Tim Hortons? No. Come on. <laughs> Tim Hortons. Starbucks is because, the reason why they're in business is the, the experience factor. People like to sit there, I go into my work and I get a Starbucks mug, and see I drink Starbucks. It's a stature, it's something. No one's going to go in there and put their Tim Hortons cup down, right? In a meeting, in a high level meeting. It's embarrassing to put a Tim Hortons cup down. That's the way Starbucks is. They create Y factor. That is how... How does this relate to sustainable design? Well, if you have a passive engineer or passive architecture that can't get the client excited about building net zero buildings, it's not going to work. You're not good. Decisions are based on emotion, not technical, not financial. Even though I said finance is a big thing. You make decisions on emotional state. Dalai Lama, Lululemon, who buys $100 shorts? He's worth $11 billion now. This guy, Chip, because he created a culture. Who does yoga? I have a hard time doing yoga, but I buy Lululemon anyways. <laughs> anyways, design versus performance. This is what you guys do. What we model as engineers never perform. This is our modeling results. This is a study has been done. This is actual building performance. It's all over the map. Okay, how do we solve that? This is a company that I own, and I know that maybe uh, just, just the context of what you guys can see in the future. iSmart is something I've, I, I'm doing now. It has 
and creating an artificial intelligence in the building. So the building actually is programmed to learn. We create code if it's too cold in the building. I go in and I constantly add code to the control to check this, check that, check that, so that the next time it's cold, it does all that. Eventually, there's no such thing as artificial intelligence. There's going to be enough rules in iSmart that the building should operate on autopilot. That's for you guys to take home. I have at least seven interested parties before I even uh, launched iSmart. So anyways, I don't want to get too much into that. Um, that's the future of how to actually make buildings operate the way they were designed. Yes. Do you balance that with passive, with promoting passive design? Well, passive design is, you know, getting the load down, all that stuff, right? Reducing energy consumption. This handles how do we guarantee that the building actually operates the way it's designed? This is the autopilot of the building. Okay? And I'm using that as a, an, an analogy here. And of course, iSmart is more than that. We, we bring in financing, energy monitoring. This is the continuous optimization that you guys might be interested in. And it affects maintenance and operation. So the dream here is, and once again, after being inspired by Steve Jobs, if we're successful with these seven clients, you should have no maintenance manual and no operation manual. Every Apple product does not have a manual. You open it up, the iPhone, you turn it on, it does it. My MacBook at home, I turn it on, it self-configures. That is the future. And you're hearing it from me today, of the future. And, I, and I'm right into it right now. This is my passion when I left Cobalt Engineering. They didn't want to go down this road, and I wanted to pursue this. That's another reason. And my four-year-old daughter, that's 90% of the reason. So I want to leave you with this. Insanity is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting different results. The greatest ideas are the simplest. It's just the simplest ideas. Thank you. Thank you.